Okay, well, let's get going on this edition of Monday Night Metrics. And we're very excited for our regular audience to switch up a little bit. Instead of talking about the how, why, and how to calculate B2B SaaS metrics, we're going to be talking about the latest FY20 B2B SaaS benchmarks that RevOps Squared recently published. And of course, we have Ben Murray, the SaaS CEO, as our regular co-host. Hey, Ben. Hey, Ray. Greetings, everyone. Thanks for joining. And tonight, we're also joined by someone that I refer, refer to as the Yoda of B2B SaaS metrics and a guru I followed for many, many years, Dave Kellogg. Welcome, Dave. Hey, thanks. Thanks for having me, Ray. Good to be here with you, Ben. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Dave. So as always, um, we think the biggest benefit of Monday Night Metrics is when our audience has an opportunity to ask questions. So please feel free if you have any questions, go ahead and enter those in chat and Ben and I will be monitoring those and we will try to answer those in real time. So with that, Ben, Dave, you ready to get going? Yeah, let's do it. Yep. Okay. So the first benchmark that we're going to talk about is the traditional old guard metric for all B2B SaaS investors and entrepreneurs, and it's the rule of 40. And once again, for everybody, we talk about all the calculations, but the rule of 40 is very simple. It takes the growth rate, it adds your EBITDA. Some people will use free cash flow, and that's your rule of 40. And it's been known to say if you have a 40 or above rule of 40, you're going to be much more interesting and valuable to investors. Well, what's interesting, because of the impact of the pandemic in 2020, our median growth rate overall, without looking at any revenue or ACV cohorts, was down to 22%. And that was from 39% in 2019. And when you look at that from a company size perspective, you'll see that almost every cohort was in the kind of 20% as low as 18% at median for the largest companies. So that was the, the benchmarks based on company size for FY20. Now in first half 21, we have not had a chance to um, engage enough companies to have statistically valid growth rate, but it looks like from anecdotal evidence I'm seeing is we'll back up to about 30% growth rate. So I have a question here for you. I'll start with Ben. Mm -hmm. You see growth rates that are a little bit reduced from what we typically have seen in the B2B SaaS industry over the last five years. If you were the CFO of a company and you saw one or two quarters of decreasing growth rate from the previous year, as a CFO, what type of questions would you be asking? Yeah, definitely. I mean, you know, sometimes you see flat month to month, but yeah, if we were declining quarter over quarter over year over year, you know, definitely that raised some red flags, you know, as far as, you know, what's happening, you know, with our pipeline and sales, of course, you know, CFOs work closely with sales and marketing. So there should be some understanding there. You know, of course, this is a little different, you know, with COVID, you know, in, in 2020, you know, it's hard to compare to the prior year, but definitely red flags would be going off and talking to my operating teams, uh, you know, in sales and marketing and, you know, looking at churn retention to see what's going on. So the operational hat would kind of kick in here. Now, Dave, you've been a CEO of multiple companies. And I know you consult and are on the board of several more companies. Now, we always hear about this 3-3-2-2-2 three, three, two, two, two kind of ratio. You should be growing year over year, year, year one, year two at 3x, year two to year three at 3x. You look at the benchmarks here and you see things like, Wow, 48% was at the 75th percentile last year. Do you think the 33222 model is old school? So I think it's, I mean, look, venture capitalists have a habit of looking at their top quartile of performance uh, companies and then telling everyone that's the average, right? <laughs> Just roughly speaking. So I feel a great degree of uh, empathy for anyone running either CFO or CEO of a VC backed company. VCs are wonderful people, they give us cash. But, but they tend to have a little bit sometimes happy years when it comes to these rules of thumbs and benchmarks. So, so yeah, I think triple, 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 double, double is fantastic best practice. I mean, if you want to be an you know, Olympic athlete, that's the way to get there. But if you want to just benchmark against other SaaS companies, uh, personally, I'd go for data like yours. That's great advice. And to everyone here, I, I saw a question on chat and people were asking, is this an annual growth rate? And the answer is yes, this is annual growth rate. And once again, as I said, it was significantly decreased in FY20 from FY19, 
but we're seeing a return closer to 30% at median for first half of 21. Well, let's move on from company growth rate. Oh, and by the way, for anybody on tonight, if you wanna see some of these metrics based upon different attributes, such as, well, does ACV impact growth rate or does distribution model impact growth rate or who I sell to enterprise versus mid-market, um, we're going to be showing, sharing a website address with you later where you can go in and see the different growth rates by every one of those company profile attributes. So let's go ahead and move to EBITDA, Dave and Ben. Oh, wait a minute. Before I do that, Dave, I almost deprived you of being able to talk about something that I just love that you've been doing recently, and that's the R squared factor. And that is, how does a particular metric like growth rate impact enterprise value to the next 12 month revenue multiples. So can you share with our audience a little bit about what R squared is and how you went about calculating this? Sure, sure. So two, two things. One, just keep an eye on the chat. Any other questions? Very quickly. Yeah, the rule of 40 works with negative free cash flow or EBITDA. That's kind of the point is you're trying to balance growth and profit. So if you're you know, growing at 40%, losing 40% free cash flow, then you have a R40 score of zero. R squared, I think of as explanatory power. I can't remember this second, the precise name in the metric and statistics, but it's how much of the dependent variable is explained by the independent variable. And to me, it basically says how much it impacts. In English, what thing impacts the most when we're looking at enterprise value to next 12 months revenue? And by the way, the whole point of the rule of 40 was it was supposed to kind of explain uh, your multiple better than just growth alone. Uh, and at some point in time, it has that in frothier times, let's say, <laughs> growth tends to, in this case, forward growth, right? Uh, forward growth is, I think, of the metrics we're going to look at has the highest explanatory power, i.e. it's the biggest impact. If you're trying to increase your multiple, this is where you should focus. So 0.37 in R squared, really, you can, the minimum you can have is zero, and the max you can have is one. So 0.37 has some pretty high correlation to enterprise value multiples, right, Dave? Uh, I'd say it's pretty high, but I've seen 0.5. I mean, I, I've seen it. Uh, I've seen R40 be as high as 0 0.5, 0 0.55. But uh, as we'll see tonight, some stuff goes all the way down to zero. So, so it, it's a, it explains a fair bit of it. 40% of the variance is explained by this alone. Well, let's move to something that I, you also calculated. And it wasn't the revenue growth rate, but it was implied ARR growth rate. So tell me a little bit about why we even have this ARR growth rate separate from revenue. Yeah, because look, the real thing, in my opinion, and with private companies, the real thing VCs look at is there's a big difference in public and private companies. Uh, in my mind, public companies are a bit of a guessing game. Right, you 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 have things like implied ARR, or imputed ARR, or billings, right? Revenue plus change in deferred revenue, um, and that's all because public companies don't release the same metrics that private companies do. So, so I believe the core metric is ARR growth, and, and when you're dealing with a private company, uh, that's the number one thing I think VCs look at. We could talk about the other ones, but this also notice this is forward growth here again. It's um, so impl sorry, implied ARR growth is trailing. Uh, but it's explaining your forward revenue multiple. And here it's doing about 30% of it. It, it. Basically meaning to me, it's got a pretty high explanatory power. People are looking at this metric and deciding how much your company's worth. Great, thank you. Ben, do we have any questions there we should address now or? Yeah, there are a few that came in uh, when thinking about next 12 months and coming up with uh, the R squared, how many data points are you collecting to get this calculated value? So I guess, yeah, what, what, what data is going into this or data points or data set? Someone's asking. I can tell you where I got them from, just, just to make it, I didn't do a lot of the stats myself. I just use a site called Ameritech Public Comps Database, Database, M-E-R-I-T-E-C-H, Meritech, And they actually give you a site where you can just lay out one variable against the other. Um, and it will show you the scatter plot. It'll show you the least squared line and it will tell you the R squared. But you know, that that is a great question. And for the other benchmarks that we're sharing tonight, this was based upon a population of 748 private B2B SaaS companies. So the benchmarks themselves are from those 748 and the R squared is from Meritech, as Dave just said. Ben, anything else on there we should answer right now? Yeah, let's keep moving. We got a few slides and then we can circle back here. Okay, well, now somebody asked a question about EBITDA or free cash flow, but here we see a lot of red. 
So the median EBITDA in FY20 was minus 8%, but it was actually a little bit better than it was in FY19. So Ben, as a CFO of venture-backed SaaS companies, does this concern you? No, I mean, I think, you know, it gets back to the rule 40. What's your priority? If it's growth, right, you're sacrificing profitability to reach that. You know, at some point, I always say it's got to level out, right? You got to have that path to profitability, you know? So if this was like high growth venture back, you know, not surprised, you know, maybe once you move into the PE world, you know, then, yeah, I would be a little surprised with this. You know, maybe it's a short-term negative EBITDA, but eventually, right, you've got to have that path to profitability. Yeah. And one of the things that's very interesting in the data, and I won't say that the number of PE or private equity backed firms is statistically valid, Mm -hmm. but when I did slice this based upon types of funding, I found that private equity backed companies had an EBITDA of about 1%. So we saw more of a focus on some level of operating margin and profitability than we did in the VC world, which will trade off more high growth for lower operating profits. Does that make sense to you, Dave, those trade-offs? Yeah, it does. Look, in general, the investment model, and again, these are broad sweeping generalizations, so that they'll always be wrong sometimes. But in general, the PE investment model is we write a big check accompanied by a big piece of debt to buy a company, and then we don't want to write any more checks. <laughs> so <laughs> yes. pretty much. So, so, so they, they do focus on you know, cash, cash flow break even. Um, and, and so it's not surprising, yeah, that they're, they're focusing their companies on EBITDA break even. And, and they're basically saying, grow as fast as you can without losing cash. It's the rough, whereas VCs say, grow as fast as you can obeying good unit economic constraints, right? You can burn as much cash as you want to if your CAC is 1.1 and your net dollar retention is 130, I will give you wheelbarrows full of money <laughs> to go acquire customers. Uh, but that, that's not how it works in PE land. And by the way, we're gonna get to CAC ratio and CAC payback period in just a minute, but because of time, let's move a little faster. We're not gonna spend a lot of time on the actual rule of 40 because rule of 40 is your growth rate plus your EBITDA or free cash flow if you use free cash flow instead. But here we have a rule of 40. It's been a rule in the SaaS industry for 10, 12 years, but we're not even close to rule of 40 in this private company benchmarking research. Dave, does that surprise you that rule 40 is not really even close to reality? No, I mean, to me, it was always pretty aspirational. I viewed it as a high bar. And, you know, I think that the more you're a big public company, the the more maybe you can do it. But but I've always felt personally that, that, you know, getting a rule of 40 score of 40, and and ironically, some of your companies are doing it earlier on. I I always thought it was maybe a waste that that, that you, you probably should be investing more in product. You should be investing more in growth, even if it's not giving you immediate return. So, uh, the number one thing I end up telling companies about rule of 40, if you're $10 million in ARR, even $20 million in ARR, certainly if you're five or two, like, don't worry about it yet. Um, it, it, it's much more for the middle schoolers and high schoolers you know, than the elementary schoolers. Yeah. Well, it's interesting you say that because rural 40 is a multivariate, even though it's only two variables kind of metric. And Ben, I know we've talked before about things like customer lifetime value to CAC. We're going to cover some of those benchmarks in just a minute. But what's your perspective as a CFO on the value of multivariate SaaS metrics versus single variable? Well, I think, you know, maybe for a CFO and those who are crunching the numbers, it's a little easier to understand, hey, all those inputs that are going into these calculations. But, you know, for the executive team, right, you got to explain what's happening here. You know, the growth plus the margins, you know, LTV to CAC affects so many different areas on your P&L and your business. Lots of inputs say into that. You know, so I think it's really explaining that. And what are our levers? You know, if, if that metric is a North Star for us and what are those levers to improve it? Hey, Ray, I got to weigh in on this one, too. I, I agree with Ben, but, but just to me, it all makes sense if you just say, if I were an investor trying to figure out whether I'm interested and your LTV to CAC was two, I'd say no. No more questions. Really nice meeting you, right? <laughs> It'd be over, right? So, so and a lot of these metrics, that these compound metrics, as I call them, they're useful, like your CAC payback period. If it's 48 months, I don't have any other questions. You know, really nice yeah. meeting you, Ray. <laughs> right. and, so, and we're going to so, show those benchmarks that Dave Kellogg would say, 
nice meeting you, but let's not talk again. <laughs> so it all depends. If you're trying to fix a company, though, you want to know what's yep. going on. It's a Ben's point. Um, so go ahead, Ray. The next slide, you know, as I said, I've been following Kelblog for quite a while. And I remember in 2018 where you were talking about the R squared factor of the rule of 40. And I think it was 0. 0.42. Three years later, and it's 0. 0.15. What's the story? Yeah, I mean, what it means is the kind of growth versus free cash flow balance is no longer the, the number one explainer by a long means, i.e. in English, investors care less about balancing growth with profit than they care about growth. That would be the way I'd say it. Because if rule of 40 were the strongest predictor of forward revenue multiple, that would mean they care a lot about an intelligent balance between growth and profit. If growth alone is the stronger metric by more than a factor of two, then that means, in my mind, they're caring more about growth than balancing growth and profit. That's a great insight. And there's uh, multiple avenues for growth. There's new customers, there's existing customer growth. And we're going to talk about which one of those is more important right now to valuation. But before we do that, let's look at other customer acquisition efficiency metrics and benchmarks. Now, this is, and Ben and I have talked about blended CAC ratio, new name CAC ratio, and expansion CAC ratio before. But blended CAC ratio really looks at how much sales and marketing investment that you make to get every dollar of new and growth ARR. And what's interesting, this number continues to get more expensive every year, which is not good for blended CAC ratio, the closer to one, the better. It was $1.33 of sales and marketing investment to get $1 of ARR, newer growth last year. And you can see what's interesting is companies get bigger, they become less efficient as measured by blended CAC ratio. You look at 10 million to 25 million, it takes $1.39 at median to get $1 of ARR. And at 25 to 50 million, it takes $1.46. So my question first is to um, Ben, huh? what do you think, Ben, about blended CAC ratio as a metric to help determine what investments you're going to make in sales and marketing? How important is it to you as a CFO? Yeah, I like it because it's very, for me, it's very intuitive, right? We got sales and marketing spend and we've got AR bookings coming out the other end. So just again, that balance and what that's costing us. So I think very easy, easy metric to calculate, uh, you know, and then I think, I don't know if we have slides where then, you know, we have the new CAC ratio, existing CAC ratio, because there could be do, very do, two different dynamics. We could be great at new business and horrible at expansion and vice versa. So again, starting that high layer, layer digging into the segments and then working with my sales and marketing team on how we can improve that. And before we get into expansion versus new name CAC ratio, Dave, when you see the cost going up to get each dollar of ARR in that 10 million up to 50 million, what explains that from your experience? I think, so first, as we'll come to you later in the, in the show, in my mind, to buy a dollar of annual subscription, these is not expensive numbers. I, I think in some ways investors scrutinize this too much. If they say, oh, it's above a dollar fifty or above two dollars, if I'm gonna get somebody who's gonna give me a dollar a year that expands by 20% every year for 10 years, I, I'd pay a lot more than two dollars for that. So 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 I do think this ratio almost gets over scrutinized. I think the answer to your question, Ray, and this is I'm not sure, but I think it's the low-hanging fruit argument. I mean, there is an argument that when you start your company, there's a bunch of people you had in mind, you go pick that fruit, right? There's an experimentation phase. Uh, and then you're like, uh-oh, we need to sell a, a new use case, or uh-oh, we need to sell a new buyer. And, and when you hit those inflection points, then your cat goes up because you're spending money trying to figure out how to do that. Dave, I mean, dead on from what I've experienced over the last couple of years in my consulting business is we find companies hit 10 or 15 million and like, oh, we have to go to a new market to keep growing to 50 million. Maybe it's going from commercial to enterprise, or in sometimes it's going from the US market to maybe Europe. And that's why it's so important to measure all your metrics, but especially CAC ratio on a cohort by cohort basis. So you don't have your overall average being biased by the fact that it's taken $2.50 to sell to an enterprise customer versus the $1.30 it costs you to sell to a SMB. Does that make sense to you, Dave? Yeah, it does. I mean, one thing we'll have to do right offline is do a correlation between CAC and, and growth rate, because in effect, you're spending money for future growth. And in most calculations of CAC, because that, that investment for future payoff is included in sales and market expense, the basically the faster you're growing, the higher your CAC is. 
So, so I, I think that's what you're talking about, cohorts, and that's your solution to the problem. So, so yes. So Ben, the next two slides, I have a question for you as a CFO. Mm -hmm. We talk about new name CAC ratio, and this is how many dollars of sales and marketing investment does it take to get $1 of new logo ARR? And you can see here at median, it's $1.56, but sometimes you know at 75th percentile, which is really 25th percentile in my mind, it can go up to $2. And then if you go to how much does it cost to get a dollar of expansion ARR, from existing customers, the median's at 69 cents. And you can see almost any size company, it's, you know, it's mm -hmm. as low as 50 cents. It does get any higher really than 84 cents on median. Why wouldn't we just invest more in existing customer growth and not as much in new name since it's not as efficient? Well, right, both are important. You know, expansion, right? You know, net negative churn and the retention provides tremendous growth you know, along with new, but, you know, you still, the, you still need new customers to eventually to expand down the road, right? So they, for me, kind of go, go hand in hand. But Dave, as a CEO, let's say you're a $20 million ARR company and you've got nice top line growth and you're looking at the annual budgeting process and say, how much money and resource do I allocate to new name customer versus existing customer expansion? Is there any mathematical way? Is that more of a intuition? How do you make that decision, Dave? So, so two things, Ray. One, uh, I'm always lagging here on the prior points, but on your thing about cohorts, if you look at retailers, they have a thing called same store sales, right? Because Starbucks grows by increasing sales within a store and opening more stores. I think that's basically the, the, the notion you're talking about, kind of same sales rep sales. Um, and those are your cohorts. And, and, and I think that's a fantastic idea. I even did a blog post about it a while ago. Now, back to your question, which is how do you think about this in building a plan or a model for the future? I have a rule of thumb. We've not talked about it before, so it might surprise you, but I look at percent of revenue from new versus existing customers. So I step out of the unit economics content. I, I walk away from CAC and, and, and churn and LTV. I just say, when I look at the P&L, how much of my revenue is coming from new versus existing customers? And for a company the size you mentioned, I like it to be around 30%. I, I personally think when it gets to be 50, 60, people are like, oh my gosh, all you're doing is milking the install base. And if it's down at 10 or 15, people are like, well, gosh, how come you're not even trying to sell anything to your existing customers? So I, I do have a rule of thumb, but, it, but I, I do it off the P&L. Yeah, that's really good insight. It's interesting. And this is really company size appropriate also. I used to use that 70, 30, 70% of growth ARR would come from new name customers, 30% from existing. I've seen that change over the last two years. And now it's about 66% new and 34% growth. And if you have a product led growth customer acquisition motion, I'm seeing even a higher percentage on existing customer growth because it is not a consistent standard of what I put into expansion versus new name customer. Any insights on that, Dave or Ben? Sounds good to me. The only thing I'd say, which you didn't ask me yet, is I get a little suspicious about where you allocate customer success cost on this whole thing. Um, so, so as soon as people, I like the blended CAC because there's nowhere to hide, you know. <laughs> um, but 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 as soon as you start breaking it out, I want to know. Well, customer success. If they're not selling new ARR, but they're maintaining the relationship, do they count or don't count? Some people leave them out. Um, so the more you break it, the more suspicious I get. On PL, uh, on, so on the two-thirds, one-third, it's close enough to 70-30. And on the PLG, absolutely makes sense because that's kind of the point of the strategy, land small and expand big. Now, Ben, we talked about this to our audience a few weeks ago, and that is the metric of CAC payback period. So just real quick, for the people who weren't there who may not know this, can you just give a high-level definition of what CAC payback period measures before I go into the benchmarks? Yeah, sure. You know, we have CAC. So how much does it take to acquire one customer? And then from the cash flows from that customer, usually gross margin adjusted, how many months does it take to pay back that initial upfront CAC? So right when we see this, the median, you know, looks like are the, you know, about 19 months. So, you know, if we spend, you know, $2,000 on CAC, you know, at month 19, we finally paid back those $2,000. And that's really important is that it's gross margin adjusted. 
most people don't look at CAC ratio. And of course, the SAS magic number is the same thing. It's not gross margin adjusted. So this is one of the first customer acquisition metrics that actually looks at it from a gross margin adjusted basis. One of the questions I would ask you, Dave, is I've spoken to a lot of investors and often they say, well, if it's not 12 to 16 months, I'm not that interested. And honestly, if you have an ACV of 10K and above, I don't see 12 months ever. What's your perspective on what's reasonable for a CAC payback period? I think around 18 to 24 months, roughly. In some ways, if you look at most companies' gross margins at around 80%, you can take the CAC ratio and uplift it by 20% and convert it to months, <laughs> roughly, unless something's mm -hmm. really off on their gross margin profile. Um, and you can get it. So, so if you think a CAC of 1.5 is reasonable, you uplift that 20%, you get 1.8. 1.8 and times 12 is what, around 20 months, right? So you're in that 18 to 24 month range. I think it's hard to believe, you know, the single lowest CAC ratio I ever saw it was a friend of mine's company was 0.4. So maybe he was a point, but just epic, monopolist, small market, own a niche, right? Like it's not going to happen to you. You're not going to get to 0.4. <laughs> So, so I think 18 to 24 months in enterprise for sure. Yeah. And the other thing I would say to um, the founders and CEOs on the, on the phone today is I would trade off growth rate for CAC payback period. So if the board of investors say, oh, you got to get your CAC payback period down to 15 or 18 and you're at 24. I was talking to Byron Dieter at Bessemer Ventures. He's like, hey, if you're growing at 50 or 60% a year and you're at a 20 million to 50 million, I'm okay with a 24 to even 32 month payback period, as long as you have higher growth rate than average. That resonate with you, Dave and Ben? Yeah. And retention, right? If you have great retention, I've got a little more leeway to be on the longer end of CAC payback. But if retention is not great, then I'm going to be a little more strict with, with payback. Go ahead. Greg, I got to weigh on that one real quick. Just mathematically, it's back to what you said before. The more you, the faster you're growing, the more you're spending now to hire resources that are not yet productive, and that's going to drive your CAC up. So that's why I think Byron's okay with that. Okay. Well, let's look at the R squared factor of CAC payback period. Um, we didn't have one for CAC ratio, but it's 0.17, which is much lower, almost 50% lower than either ARR growth or revenue growth. Did this surprise you when you did the calculation, Dave? A little bit, but, but not too much because it's really only part of the picture, right? And, and in the end, the investors are looking for growth. And, and this, this really just tells you how long it takes to get paid back on your CAC investment. And, and I've always viewed payback metrics as risk metrics, right? How long is my bet on the table? They're not return metrics. Um, and I think valuation is either about growth or return, not just risk. You with me? It, a lot of people forget that, that a payback metric, if I gave you a dollar and gave you a dollar back 10 minutes later, you'd have a one day payback, but you'd only get a dollar back. <laughs> It'd be a crappy investment, right? So. Ben, it sounds like SaaS industry is an arbitrage game. It's like where <laughs> I get the highest return versus risk. Right. You know, and I wrote in a post, you know, CAC is like debt. You get, you have to pay it back over time. And just like Dave said, you know, kind of that risk metric, you know, it's like, how long is that cash tied up? you know, before it gets paid back, you know, getting to the, the risk factor of that. Hey, Ben, CAC payback period. You've been CFO of multiple companies at different stages. At what point in the journey do you start thinking CAC payback period is an important metric to even really calculate and understand? Yeah, you know, I talk to founders a lot about this. One, you have to have enough data, right? If you're only acquiring one new customer every other month, you know, there's just not enough data there. So if you have enough volume, you're growing, you know, you're investing, you know, a material amount in sales and marketing. And and also, if you if rule of 40 comes, comes into play, like how much I invest in growth versus profitability, et cetera, you know, then it could be a good time to, to look at payback. But yeah, in that PE world, when you're funding cash flow from your own on operations, you know, for me, this becomes important. Maybe if you're a VC back, maybe not as, as important. But, you know, again, depends on that stage. Dave, anything you want to add to that? No, not on this one. Okay. <laughs> CLTV, customer lifetime value to CAC ratio. And we see on the top right as an overall industry average across these 748 companies, it's 4.2. And I know a lot of times, years ago, it was 3.0 was the gold standard. But before we go there, real quick, Ben, would you mind sharing with the audience at a high level what CLTV to CAC measures? 
Right. It's just how many turns, you know, it's looking at, say, if our CAC is 2000, you know, and if we want an LTV to CAC, you know, of above three, we need a lifetime value from that customer of 6,000, you know, so the 6,000 divided by two, and that equals our LTV to CAC ratio. And yeah, kind of that rule of thumb out there is greater than three. And it's important for everyone to know. And by the way, if you want to understand more about how these metrics are calculated, we'll be sharing some resources at the end. But customer lifetime value is both gross margin adjusted and Mm -hmm. churn adjusted. So it looks at both customer retention and your operating efficiency from a a gross profit perspective. Dave, you invest and advise a lot of companies. Does this kind of resonate with where you've seen the trends going where CLTV to CAC at three is just not the target anymore? Yeah, I I think so. Look, look, this metric, and this will be a good segue. I've always thought it was three to five. If you just asked me on an elevator what the range was, I'd say three to five. And obviously five is better than three. To me, this is the the balancing scale metric, how much you're paying for something versus how much it's worth, right? And, And that's why I love this metric in theory, but the problem in the title of my Saster talk was churn is dead, long live net dollar retention. Um, the, the problem with LTV is it's based on churn. And I think churn is kind of a flawed slash abused metric. So this is probably you know SAS metric I'm most personally disappointed in because <laughs> I don't think it's it could have been great, but it's just not quite doing it. Ben? Yeah, I was going to say, Dave, you know, with this, there are a lot of inputs into this and you see so many different calculations. Like where do you take it with a grain of salt when you see like someone say present a 50 or a hundred LTV to CAC, do you just kind of like, Oh, that's great. I don't believe it. You know, what, what's kind of your, your BS factor on when you see these in say pitch decks or, or port goes. Yeah. I like one time I was working with an investment banker and he literally entered the formula. And it was like equals min of 10 comma or one over churn. <laughs> so, so he was capping it at 10, which oh. I thought was actually, you know, it was a little strange for a SAS metric to insert a formula like that. But uh, some people do that. You know, I, I just think if it's going to be crazy high, it's crazy high because churn is crazy low. And if churn is crazy low, I'll bet you they're dividing by the wrong thing. A lot of people divide by the whole ARR base, not the ATR base, the available to renew. So if you're doing three-year deals and you only have a fraction of the installment, literally I had one company say they're, they're, they had like 1% churn. And I was like, well, that's awesome. And they're like, well, we do three-year deals and we're only two years old. I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> it's like, whoa. So that, that's the problem to me. And that's why churn is gameable. And that's why I love NRR because it's, it's much harder to game. And that's why the next metric that we're going to show the benchmark is not churn. It's gross dollar and net dollar retention. To your point, people do game churn a lot. And is it logo churn? Is it dollar churn? What's the numerator? Is it the ARR from only the customers who stayed. I even saw one publicly company, as I would kind of reverse engineered how they were calculating it, they only used the customers who were still on contract the second year versus who was on contract a year ago. It was craziness. Survivor bias. Churn excluding customers who decided to not do business with us anymore (laughs) is the name of that metric. (laughs) So here's an interesting point. When COVID hit last year, people were really concerned about churn going up dramatically in the SaaS industry. And interesting enough, churn actually didn't go up overall. We did see, however, in Q4, a little bit higher churn rate, which means a lower gross dollar retention because we saw people coming up on the end of the year contracts who wanted to get out because they're looking at reducing variable costs for FY21. But gross dollar retention was at 87% at median for last year. And this is one of those metrics. It depends on who you are as a company. Size doesn't have a lot of correlation to gross dollar retention, but ACV value does. You're going to see a much lower gross dollar retention if you have a 1K product versus if you have a 100K product. So first of all, gross dollar retention before we get into net dollar retention. Ben, does gross dollar retention, what does it tell you as a CFO? What do you look at and say, we better look at this if? Yeah, right. Gross dollar retention is looking at, you know, your existing customer base and measuring the churn and downgrades from that existing customer base. So, you know, it's, it's, it's how sticky is your product. 
you know, so of course I'm going to be measuring this on a monthly basis just to see if we have any churn issues. Do we have product issues? Do we have onboarding issues? You know, operationally what's happening that's translating into either good or bad gross dollar retention numbers. And Dave, we talk a lot about customer success today. And what is the role of customer success? And for the people on the, online, I've seen customer success as a expense, as a percentage of revenue go from two, four, six now, averaging over, a little over 10% in the B2B SaaS industry. Do you believe that customer success owns this number or do other departments co-own this number, Dave? Yeah, so so it affects is customer success, the churn prevention department, and uh, I, I would say by and large, yes. I mean, I think they're more than that, but, but right, they might be the customer value maximization department, which would put them more on net dollar. But but I think you do need to look at gross dollar, and, and the most important thing I think is don't just analyze the churn that happened. Try to analyze who churned versus who didn't. Because most people make the mistake of only analyze, like they make a taxonomy of churn and they talk about how much churn went into each bucket, but they don't ever ask the bigger, more important question, which is what separates people churn from people who didn't? And can we ch- therefore, can we try and fix the root causes of churn? That's an interesting question. And I don't want to get into futures, but I'm having, I'm doing a podcast with Nick Meta, the founder and CEO of Gainsight on Thursday. And our discussion is, does NPS, net promoter score, predict what your gross dollar retention rate may be in three, six, nine, 12 months. Dave, have you ever done any work on the correlation of those two things? Yeah, I would say loosely. I mean, look, this is maybe off topic a little bit, but but I always ask two questions. I ask the NPS question, and then I ask the do you intend to renew question. <laughs> and that <laughs> correlates a lot better uh, to renewal. And, and do you intend to renew and are you happy are actually two different things. I can be ecstatic, but we just got acquired and we're shutting down the contract. Or I could hate your guts, but you're the best alternative out there and I'm going to renew, right? So, so to me, there is a loose coupling between CSAT or NPS and intent to uh, renew. By the way, you also need to have a persona issue. Like all the end users may hate you, but the business buyer may love you and they're the person mm-hmm. who is going to do the renewal, right? So you need to look really at kind of persona-based intent to renew. If you want to predict renewals, that's what I would use. Ben, let me ask you this question because I also ask our clients to do this analysis. Look at your ICP, your ideal customer profile. And look at all the new customers in the last three, six, 12, but more importantly, 12 to 24 months that you close within your ICP and outside of the ICP and evaluate the gross dollar retention in ICP versus out. Have you ever done that? And what do you think of that idea? Yeah, I mean, that gets to the heart of cohort analysis, right? Tracking these cohorts, one by acquisition month, but then segmented cohort analysis is the demographics of the customer. Yeah, are they in your ICP, out of your ICP? What was the acquisition channel? And that's where you can get into more advanced, you know, an understanding of, of retention within your customer base. Now, I'm going to introduce the next slide. I'm going to shut the hell up and let Ben and Dave completely own this one, because this is a metric I to get way too geeked out about and too excited about. And that is net dollar retention, which goes by multiple names. So first of all, Ben, why don't you talk a little bit what net dollar retention is and then the other names it goes by. And then we'll have Dave opine a little bit more on NDR. Yep. So it expands on the gross dollar retention concept. So now we get the benefit of offsetting downgrades and churn with expansion from our existing customer base. So that net new expansion from our customers offsetting downgrades and churn. And hopefully then that number is above 100, which then you've also heard that's net negative churn, or this can be referred to as net revenue retention. You know, so that's where we're coming up with the, the NDR metric. Right. So net revenue retention equals net dollar retention and equals, net negative yeah. churn. It doesn't exactly look the same, but if you have a negative 10% net negative churn, that's 110% net dollar retention, right? Right. A little confusing, but just meaning, yeah, we're, we're above 100%. Okay. Well, I asked Dave because um, when he presented at the Gainsight conference uh, a little over a month ago, he talked about net dollar retention, its impact on enterprise value. So, Dave, I'm just going to shut the heck up and let you riff and opine on NDR and its impact on enterprise value. Sure. Look, I, I think while we're all analytical people here, metrics are subject to fashion, just like hemlines or colors <laughs> in styles. And NDR, in my opinion, is the it metric, right? It's the one that everyone's watching right now. I would say two to four years ago, it was CAC payback period, 
right? A couple of years before that, it was either CAC or magic number, right? Like literally we can go back and maybe we should chronicle this, Ray, like, you know, the metric of the year uh, and just watch how it changes. But, but, you know, it's today is now NDR's time. It's the one that everybody's watching. Um, so it has a very high predictive value uh, to, to company valuation. The theory being that, that you're, you're, Look, it's a better viewpoint than CAC because the whole CAC paradigm, the other thing about CAC was it, it assumed zero expansion, right? They'd say, what's the annual contract worth? How much did you pay for it, right? And, and, and it, it, these, are, these are not annuities. They're not equal payments. They expand. So, so uh, that's, in my mind, why everyone's looking at this metric. Um, but this metric is also gameable. You can build it in, right? Uh, you, you can build it. You know, right now, I think most SaaS companies, if you offered they could offer you three deals, 100, 100, 100, or 80, 100, 120. Even though the second deal from a you know net present value was lower, they'd sign that deal every time, right? And I'd build the comp plan to make the salesperson make more money on that deal, frankly, right? Um, and so it's a little crazy for the finance types, but if everyone's watching this metric, I, I can sign a deal that builds in a 20% NDR, which is well above your mean. So, and then that's what I think happens because I think over time people will game this metric and it will kind of get ruined and then we'll move on to a new one. In fact, speaking of gaming, and we look at the median of 104% for private SaaS companies. If you look at public company comps in the last year, companies like Snowflake or Twilio or um, Datadog, you're going to see 140, 150, even 160% net dollar retention. So number one, know that that's the best of the best. So you're definitely going to have that selection bias built in. Number two, they're all product led. So they go in and they get very small agreements often at the entry. And then as usage expands, both across organizations, but volume based, because they're also using usage based pricing, the combination of usage based pricing and product led growth acquisition motion artificially makes your NDR look much better bigger. So you got to factor that in when you do the calculation, right guys? Yeah. And I'd say on my side, you know, working with founders and, and with multiple pricing and revenue streams, they could have subscriptions, usage, transaction, et cetera. And then, you know, it depends on, Hey, I'm throwing that all into there to calculate my expansion. So like Dave said, you know, it could be gamed, you know, but yeah, there's a lot of, I think, creative, you know, factoring when it comes into, you know, if you have multiple revenue streams and multiple pricing streams of how you're getting there. Look, to me, if you're truly expanding with the customer, if it's the new products or new users, the use cases, more API calls, whatever it is, if they're getting more value, I, I think it's fine that you have a, a 150% NDR. I mean, as an as investor, I'd love it. But on the flip side, if you're not, Right. Like if I'm just paying 50 percent more every year for something and getting the same value, eventually I'm going to be unhappy. So I, I think right now people are not really looking enough at both sides of this coin. Um, and, and over time, they may be. Yeah, it's, it's great now that I'm, you know, I got 150 percent more out of Ben than I did last year. But but how many more years is it going to let me do that? Uh, the assumption is I'm delivering commensurate value, which is great. But but I better be. OK, well, it's 445, but we've done a pretty good job. We only have a couple more metrics benchmarks I wanted to talk about, and that is gross margin. And Ben, I know we talked about gross margin the other day, how to calculate it. And the median subscription gross margin in FY20 was 75 percent. Anything you want to add as a CFO, if you saw I'm um, at 71 or 72 percent. What questions would you be asking, or would you even be concerned if you're much below 75 percent? Yeah, I mean, operation. I know we'll get into the, like the correlations, but for me, I'm always looking at gross margins. What's my overall gross margin? One, is it calculated correctly? Cogs versus OpEx, and then what's my margin by revenue stream? And then I can dig into the company to see, hey, we're doing really well here, but it's offset because our service margin is very negative. And do we understand that? Is that we're are we purposeful with that? So for me, you know, I do look at gross margins and seeing what we're trying to get to because right once you get nice gross margin, it's dropping a lot of cash flow, creates a lot of operating leverage. Dave, have you ever had an experience where gross margin was in the 60% or worse? And what did you do about it? Uh, not on subscription, no. I mean, I had a blended that was pretty low due to a highly negative services business that was too big a portion of the business. So, so we increased services profitability and shrunk it as a percent, and that boosted up. But with straight subscription gross margin, I got to the slide, 
No, I've always kept it between 75 and 80. And I'm frankly a little surprised how broad the range is on the downside. I'm surprised people are running at 62, 66. So hopefully, especially now, because at least back in the day, you might have been making a, a data center investment. But then again, you'd be amortizing that. I, so I, I don't know. Uh, I'm a little surprised uh, to see it uh, get that low. I totally agree with that because most companies today aren't making those capital investments, which changes everything. And I can see that investors really pay a lot of attention to gross margin. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Of- if you had a 62 or 64% gross margin there, Dave, if you were a VC or a PE firm looking at a deal, would it be a nice to meet you? I'm out of here. Yeah, I think it might. It may not be correlated to Ford valuation multiple, but it, it may be strongly kind of correlated to can you raise money? Um, and and I, I think it is, right? Because it, it, it's kind of a yes, no question. I, I personally think if you're below 70, I mean, if you're below 80, if you're below 75, you're in my opinion, you're going to get a lot of questions as to what's going on. Um, and if they're good answers, great. But, but, but if you're below 60 or even 65 or 70, uh, I, I think at some point it's one of those, Hey, it was nice to meet you. I, I don't know exactly where that, that line is, but, but this will be binary and it will be a thanks, but no thanks. Well, that's it for the benchmarks, but I don't want to end there because we've had a lot of questions, Ben, Dave, do you mind if I go through some of the questions and throw them out to you? Yep. So one is, would you include customer success commissions and COGS? For cost me, of sale, or cost of sales. Oh, for I'm cost. Sure. Of, if we're saying not, I no, I wouldn't have customer, any commissions and cogs. I'd have that part of my sales expense and opex. And the question, let me do just spend a question, Ben. When you calculate the new customer CAC ratio, would you include customer success or no? No, and and whenever I talk about customer success, it's like, do they have a quota? Or are they trying to sell? And usually, then I keep them in cogs. You know, but if they are trying to sell, if they have a quota, they're comped on some sort of expansion or whatever, uh, other than retention, you know, if it's quota based, then I'm going to put them in my sales uh, cost. I agree with you. It actually creates a little bit of a perverse incentive to have them sell, right? Because as soon as you start making them sell a little bit, you feel the need to put them in sales expense, which puts them in the CAC ratio. But but I, I definitely agree with where you're coming from. Boy, this is a, and I saw Ben that you've answered a lot of these questions in chat. Thank you. This is an interesting question, and I just conducted some research on forecast management and forecast accuracy. But the question is, for SaaS, what would you consider as key topics to focus on revenue forecasting? So are there key input variables that impact the quality of forecast? Yeah, you know, for me as a CFO doing forecast all the time, right, you have to understand the dynamics of your your recurring revenue. So, you know, how many customers do you have? What's the ARPA? You know, what's your expansion? What's your downgrade percentage churn? You know, some of those basic inputs so that you can have an accurate forecast. And then, of course, that relationship with sales and marketing, what's the pipeline looking at? What, what you know, booking should I forecast, et cetera? Uh, you know, some of those key inputs to make an, uh, re- an accurate revenue forecast. Dave, do you have any magic dust about how to make new name customer acquisition forecasting a little bit better than it, than it is? Yeah, I think I've done a series of blog posts on this. Um, I mean, the, the short formula is make sure you have clearly defined stages and rules about how stuff gets in the pipeline, because otherwise everything else, you're just analyzing muck. Um, so you, the bottom layer is have clearly defined rules. The second layer is kind of check everything every week, scrub the pipeline, um, and then the, the third layer to me is you you look at pipeline conversion. Typically, I look at week three pipeline conversion, but, but you look at pipeline conversion rates historically, and you can do a stage-weighted pipeline. You can do a forecast category-weighted pipeline, um, and, and that can start to give you what I call triangulation. I mean, if anyone interested in this topic, just do Kelblog triangulation forecast, and it's like being lost in the wilderness, right? You shoot over here, and you shoot over there, and you, you try and figure out where you are. Yeah. And the other thing I would add, there's a lot, especially with machine learning and AI becoming more and more accessible. There's forecast management tools that build in machine learning. And it looks at things like activities and events, like when, how many emails have you interacted over the last month, which it's forecasted to close in 30 days? Who have you met with? You know, what has the contract had red lines, et cetera. But there was a lot of event and activity based input that can make forecasting much better, also. True. Another question so, here. Oh, I'm sorry. Clary and Gong, just to drop two brand names in. I don't have any official association, but Clary on the former. And, and people who use Gong, they think of it primarily as a coaching tool, but it actually produces a lot of activity metrics that I, I know CROs who use Gong for forecasting, which is kind of a surprise to me, but it, yeah. exactly reinforcing your point, right? And organizations like Insight Squared also do a great job of looking at event-based in their AI forecasting module. Okay, we have a question here. Let me go up. Oh, is this data available 
segmented by other attributes like ACV or target market? And the answer is yes. In fact, there is a website we were going to disclose later on, and it's um, saskpibenchmarks.com. So S-A-A-S-K-P-I-Benchmarks.com. And you can go in there and by providing your key performance indicators values or your metrics values in a very anonymous way, you can see exactly how your like company cohort actually measures up to your own metrics by size, by ACV, by solution type, by target market, by go-to-market motion, customer um, product-led growth or sales-led growth, and even by financial investors, whether you're PE-backed or venture-backed. Like from Kay, what's a good benchmark for week three conversion for enterprise, B2B SaaS? Don't think I understand that question, Kay. So if you could clarify that, that'd be really helpful. I understand the question if you want, Ray. Please. We're, we're going over it in the chat. So week three conversion, at least, is something I use a lot. And, and, and basically, if you're going to talk about pipeline conversion, you need to have a time frame associated with it. Right. I mean, maybe for most people, it's just day one. I, I don't know. When most people say, what's your pipeline conversion rate? The question is when, because, you know, the week 12 pipeline better convert at a whole lot higher rate <laughs> than, than the day one pipeline. So I like week three. The reason I like week three is sales cannot make excuses about no time to clean up. Right. If you try and snapshot the anyone who's ever tried to snapshot a pipeline in day three of the quarter, oh, we didn't have time. People, you know, they were burned out from the close. And mm-hmm. so you say, okay, can we get all that crap done by week three? Um, and, and then you can hold them accountable for a clean pipeline. So that's why the companies I've run, we made week three kind of sacrosanct. Like that's going to be the pipeline we snapshot and do mm-hmm. analytics off for quarterly conversion. And let me add to that another really important input. And I think it's a leading indicator is your pipeline coverage ratio and pipeline coverage ratio looks at what's your new revenue, new ARR goal for a quarter and how many times that do you need pipeline? Often people will say I need a three X to four X or five X pipeline coverage ratio. Dave, I think you did a blog on that on pipeline coverage ratio, but do you think that's a good input variable to help forecasting for the quarter? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I make a very arcane distinction between pipeline coverage, which I talk about day one pipeline coverage, um, because that's what I had set marketing on to say, like, get everybody fired up to get the pipeline up to day one. We start with this, knowing it's going to bleed back down by week three. But I try to focus marketing so at the end of the quarter, they can know if they succeeded or not, right, in other pipeline generators. But then for the for the coverage ratio, it's basically one over the conversion rate, right? So if your if your week three conversion rate is forty percent, then your coverage ratio would be two point five. The only thing I'd add to you, Ray, is I look at it on a two go basis, right? Because now week six of the quarter, I've sold some, right? So, so so I should I should take I should reduce the denominator by how much I've sold, and I've also bled off some pipeline to do the selling. So so I always look at two go pipeline coverage. Um, again, in, in both conversations, it's always this notion of time. Because, you know, hey, last week of the quarter, 1.5x is probably enough, right? It better be highly qualified and ready to close or it should be not in the pipeline. But day one, 3x, yeah, 4x, maybe. And the other thing is when I look at pipeline coverage ratio, if you're in an enterprise class and you have 180 or 270 or 360 plus day sales cycle, you need to look at pipeline coverage ratio, not only current quarter, but current quarter plus one or current quarter plus two. So there was a lot of slicing and dicing you need to do on pipeline coverage ratio. Agree. I look at this quarter and next quarter in general. I worry when people do rolling four quarters. You didn't say that, but it's a lot of people do that. And then you have what I call the tantalizing pipeline. If you were Tantalus, he was punished in Greek mythology. Like you could never grab it. It was always just out of his reach. <laughs> and I, I don't want, you know, I don't want a three X coverage, but it's all four quarters out or whatever. Cause we all die uh, waiting for it to come. So, so I get nervous when we do rolling four quarter, but I'm okay with this quarter next quarter for sure. Yeah. And just like most things, whether it's forecasting or pipeline coverage, et cetera, if you have a couple whales or really big anomaly deals in your pipeline, get them the hell out of there before you look at your pipeline coverage ratio. Because you're either going to be a hero or um, not a hero very quickly. <laughs> okay, one more question. Do you distinguish between new and renewal pipeline in terms of looking at coverage? Ooh, good one. Or do you combine them? I'll take the lead on this one. Uh, so I, I, I don't actually really look that much at renewal pipeline, but I will definitely differentiate between new logo pipeline and expansion pipeline. Because hopefully expansion pipeline closes a much, much higher rate 
So, yes. Totally agree with that. You've got to look at expansion very differently. They should have separate funnels. And mm -hmm. honestly, guys, I also recommend double funnel for account base versus regular um, mass marketing because your strategic accounts, you're going to see a very different conversion rate and even a different ACV for strategic accounts versus non-strategic accounts. And Dave, I don't know if you've ever kind of looked at that double funnel for strategic versus non-strategic accounts. Yeah, one of the more interesting questions is what needs a funnel? Do, do partners need their own funnel, right? Like you can slice this on multiple dimensions. Like partner stuff probably closes the very, like in my experience, partner is one of the highest conversion rates. If you're getting deals handed to you by a partner, they're usually pretty well baked. So I think the interesting question that no one talks about is what needs a funnel. I've not seen one done for the strategic accounts, which is a great idea. I have seen it done for pipeline uh, for partners. I've also seen it done by country. Because, uh, right, not just to look at the country's conversion, uh, not their coverage. Obviously, you need to look at country-level coverage. But but uh, sometimes the conversion rate varies, too, because sometimes the sales model is different, right? But, but yeah, I love the idea, right? What needs a funnel is the real fun question. Okay. Hey, my friend David Fox asked a question, and honestly, I can't answer it, so I'm going to punt and give it to Ben and Dave. Um, what about SMB pipeline coverage? If you have, like, a 45-day or, you know, 60-day sales cycle, is pipeline coverage ratio, do you even look at it? Does week three or anything like that even matter, Dave? Yeah, but I want to do this one first because we tend to be more go-to-market oriented here. And so, so feel free to weigh in, but I don't want to dominate. But it's a great question. Uh, and the answer is, what do you do when your sales cycle is shorter than a quarter? What does day one pipeline coverage even mean? Um, and the answer to me is you got to get marketing to start forecasting pipeline. There's only, in my mind, that's the answer. Um, so, so I need to look at, right, and that's a big leap for some people because marketing people are not used to forecasting pipeline, but but I, that's the only way I know how to solve that problem because, look, to your point, when the sales cycles are long, day one coverage is a pretty good metric because if it's not in there on day one, it's probably not closing, right? Now, what do you do? And, and one of the companies I ran, we had 60-day sales cycles on occasion. So, so you need to be able to uh, try to forecast when the pipeline is going to come in. Which, which you can do if you think about it. It's not that hard if you're a marketing person. You know what programs you're running when, right? And one of the questions, we just did some um, research and we asked a question, what percentage of your new closed ARR, it, it comes from pipeline generated in quarter? If you know that, then you can look at two different pipeline coverage ratios because you know what you need it for the deals at day one. But you can also say, and I know that 20% of my revenue traditionally comes from in quarter pipeline creation. Okay, well, we are up on five o'clock West Coast time, six o'clock Ben's time and eight o'clock East Coast time. So one of the things I wanted to do for the people, and by the way, most people who joined us are still on the call. Thank you for that. Here are some additional resources I wanted to highlight. If you want to learn more about each of these KPI calculation overviews, one source is here at RevOpsquared.com, KPI overviews. Ben has a couple great sites. One is enrolling in his CFO Metrics Foundation course where you cover all of this in great detail, right, Ben? Yeah, yeah. if you're a little rusty or new to SaaS or need to improve your, your formulas and calculations to make sure you're accurate, I've got a next course launch on uh, August 23rd. Also, Ben and I have been covering all the metrics that we showed the benchmarks for today. Ben and I have conducted Monday night metric sessions over the last three months. You can go to RevOp Squared backslash Monday Night Metrics and see Ben and I spend 30 minutes talking about each one of these with all the formulas, et cetera. And then someone asked about, can I see benchmarks by company segmentation attributes? And that would be on SASKPIBenchmarks.com. So thank you everyone for your time. As a small way to say thank you, one of the things that Ben and I are offering is a complimentary metrics assessment report where I will come in, I will analyze your existing company level metrics and your key performance indicators, how are you calculating it? How do you benchmark against your like company cohort? We'll also look at the next level down kind of KPIs and do they have a causal or at least correlated relationship to the company level value creating metrics, analyze all those departmental objectives, as I said. And we're gonna give one of these away for free. And all we ask that you do is if you could spend five minutes and fill out this financial process management benchmarking research at the 
end of it, it takes less than five minutes, put in your email. We're going to be drawing one lucky person who completes this survey within the next five days. So before Friday to go ahead and give you that free $10,000 value KPI metrics assessment and benchmarking engagement. Ben, anything you want to share? No, this was a great session. Really appreciate it, uh, Dave and Ray. Dave, thank you so much. Any advice? I mean, you've lived metrics and benchmarks for so long. Any last advice you want to leave with our participating audience? I think, yeah. I mean, I just think it's really important to talk about them because just the level of detail and the stuff we're flying through, you can read blog posts, you can read the calculations. But this kind of form, I think, is fantastic because you get and every time I do a consulting project, you get to a level of detail that's just not covered in any of the blogs, even mine. Um, so, so I think it's great you guys are doing this. And well, Dave, thank you. Okay. And of course, you have Ben and I's contact information. But Dave, if anybody wants to follow you and get more benefit from your insights, where can they follow you? Sure. I mean, twitter.com slash kelblog, K-E-L-L-B-O-O-G. I'm just dropping it in the chat. And then my blog is kelblog.com. Um, and yeah, I'd love to hear from you. And I will tell everyone out there, so following Kel blog, not only are you going to get great insights, not on just metrics, but just the journey of founding and running a SaaS company. And what I found is you also get a lot of insight, even on Shakespeare and things like Hamlet from Dave. So he's a great follow. Hey, Dave, thank you so much. Ben, as always, so appreciate your partnership here. Thanks, guys. Thanks, everyone, for joining. Bye, everyone. Bye. Thanks, everybody. Cheers, all.